Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. This fragment of nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendour of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. When they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes, so they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. On the north coast of Egypt lies Rosetta, where the Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea at the end of its 7,000 kilometer long journey, which starts in the heart of Africa. It was in this city that the key to the culture of the pharaohs was discovered in 1799. The Rosetta Stone helped French Egyptologist Jean-Francois Champollion uncover the mystery of hieroglyphs. From then on, archeologists could read ancient Egyptians like an open book and they discovered that the Nile was far more than just a river. The pharaoh's subjects worshipped it, celebrated it, and associated it with numerous deities. The Nile and its delta have been the country's greatest asset since the dawn of time. Without this life force, Egypt would be merely a vast and sterile expanse of desert. Upstream from the delta, the Nile is a majestic river. On its banks lies the current capital, Cairo, founded by the Arabs in the 7th century. Today, the river must wind its way as best as it can through this megalopolis of 16 million inhabitants. It is a sprawling city which stretches almost as far as the Giza pyramids. Today, these wonders of the ancient world lie eight kilometers from the riverbank. But in the days of the pharaohs, the Nile flowed right past them. That was how the millions of blocks of stone needed to build these colossal 4,500-year-old structures were transported. To gain a better understanding of the role and the importance of the Nile in Egypt's 4,000-year-old culture, we must go further upstream to the south, where it is the shape of a green snake winding its way through the hostile deserts. In Luxor, on the site of the ancient city of Thebes, the river has always governed the daily life of the locals. The river traffic is dense there. Egypt is a big country, and the Nile covers a distance of 1,200 kilometers. The river remains the natural link between north and south. You find all sorts of boats on it, from modest dinghies used by local residents to cruise ships transporting hundreds of tourists who have come here to visit the wonders of the ancient heritage sites, such as Luxor Temple, for example. There is one boat which causes a sensation every time it passes, and it has been doing so for 100 years. And that's the legendary paddle steamer, Sudan. You are on board the oldest and most unique boat on the Nile. This boat was built in 1885 for the Egyptian royal family, for King Fuad and his son Farouk, who became the last king of Egypt. This was Agatha Christie's boat. In 1934, she and her husband were invited to spend a few days in Egypt. She began her stay in the old Winter Palace Hotel in Luxor. Then she boarded the paddle steamer Sudan and ended her trip in the old Cataract Hotel in Aswan. 
While she was on board, Agatha Christie wrote the first few chapters of her book, Death on the Nile. Since the 19th century, the Western world has had a fascination for Egypt, to the extent that we talk about Egyptomania. And when Agatha Christie set her novel, Death on the Nile, amongst Egyptian antiquities, she knew its success was guaranteed. The 30-kilometer-long mountain chain opposite Luxor helped contribute to the craze for all things Egyptian. In it lies a site which captured everyone's imagination, the Theban necropolis. Archaeologists have uncovered over 600 tombs here, the most famous of which are those of Tutankhamun and Nefertiti, the wife of Ramesses II. But each year that passes brings a new set of discoveries. Omeima has explored every nook and cranny of these desert valleys. This was her childhood dream. She fulfilled it when she became an Egyptologist, specializing in the Theban necropolis. We are in front of the tomb of Rek Mira, who was a vizier during the reign of Thutmose III. Viziers were a bit like modern-day prime ministers, so he was a very important man. Here, we have a whole wall decorated with scenes showing the Egyptian people bringing gifts to Rek Mira. You can see all sorts of things. Herds of oxen, cows, calves, crates full of pigeons, piles of grain, jars of beer and wine. There are also trays of bread. These round loaves are typical of Egypt, and you still find them today. They are called shamsi, which means sunbread, because they are left out in the sun to rise. They are dense, wholemeal loaves. This shows us the riches that came from the Nile, from the silt of the Nile and from its flood waters, from this green band of water, this green snake, which is the lifeblood of Egypt. Without the Nile, Egypt would not exist and would never have existed. We wouldn't be here today. 96% of Egypt's population of 100 million still lives on the banks of the Nile. On both sides of the river lies fertile agricultural land. The water from the Nile has always been diverted, channeled and harnessed for irrigation purposes. To water their crops, ancient Egyptians used a shadouf. This was a tool with a lever mechanism used to draw water from the river by hand. Shadoufs were still in use in the late 20th century. Today, they have been replaced by pumps, which are more practical but less environmentally friendly. Jibril, like his ancestors, helps himself to water from the river to water his cornfields. Water is scarce here. The only source of water is the Nile. That's why we're lucky to live near the river. It depends on the season, but we need a lot of water for our crops. From here, right up to the sugarcane fields near the desert, everything is irrigated by the Nile. That's a distance of about five kilometers. The Nile is the lifeblood of Egypt because we are a very agricultural nation. The river is what matters most to us. There is a famous saying that Egypt is a gift from the Nile, and it's true. At Gurna, the town opposite Luxor, the benefits of the Nile are felt as far as the desert. Every plot of land is cultivated. Some are too small for a tractor. So, 
Farmers like Mohammed use an ancient technique, the swing plow. A plow is better than a tractor. The tires tamp down the soil too much. If a tractor were to drive over here, there would be lots of soil with nothing growing in it. It's better to use oxen. We inherited this technique from our ancestors. It's a technique which dates back to the time of the pharaohs. The ancient Egyptians used a plow pulled by oxen. You can see images on some of the tombs around here. The swing plow hasn't changed since antiquity. The ancient Egyptians did not use iron. The plowshare was made of wood. Nowadays, it is made of metal. But the biggest difference between now and then is today's farmers own their land, whereas the whole of Egypt used to belong to the pharaoh. This is our legacy, so we look after it. Before he died, my father said to me, this plow will bring you luck. I asked him why. He replied, if you have a small plot of land surrounded by fields, you can use the plow to work the land without disturbing your neighbors. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description then they will pray for you, because you were careful with their crops. And he was right. That is important. In the distance, behind the fields of corn and sugarcane, lies the Theban mountain with its necropolis. The inhabitants of Gurna rarely venture that far. Only a few of them have found work there, more often than not as tomb attendants. Yet not long ago, their village stood in that spot. Living in close proximity to the dead didn't seem to bother their ancestors. In the 19th century, an archaeologist who came here found the owner of the house sleeping in a sarcophagus, in a coffin. Thousands of people lived in the village, and sadly, a few years ago, it was razed to the ground. To preserve the site, in the 1950s, the authorities decided to destroy what people here call Old Gurna. Traces of the village can be seen all over the site, but it is in the tomb of Karawef that you really get a feel for the intense activity that went on here, back when the living rubbed shoulders with the dead. Karawef was the steward of Tia, the great royal wife of Amenhotep III and mother of the famous Akhenaten. This tomb is very beautiful, but it is not only tourists and archaeologists who think so. Come and see. This network of underground galleries is like a Swiss cheese. I'm not suggesting that mice have been here, but humans have, the inhabitants of old Gurna searching for buried treasure. Tomb robbers definitely used to live down here. You can see dark patches on the ceiling from the soot that built up here over the years. You can just imagine these men searching, making holes here and there, like this one, for example. Thanks to the robbers, we can pass from one tomb to the next throughout the whole of Old Gurna. 
All that remains of old Gurna are these ruins, but life goes on. Opposite the ruins, New Gurna is celebrating a very important local event this evening, a wedding. it is traditional for people to come and greet the bride and groom and to perform a dance for them on horseback, as you can see here. The family and friends of the two families pay their respects in the afternoon. And the wedding ceremony takes place the next day or the day after. Ancient Egyptians did not ride horses. It was only when they fought the Hyksos from Anatolia in the 16th century BC that they discovered this wonderful animal. The first horses were a very small breed, only about 1.2 meters tall. It was impossible to mount them, so they had to be harnessed to a chariot. Ramesses II's chariot was an excellent example. He would drive his horses with the reins tied round his waist to leave his hands free to shoot his bow and arrow. Throughout ancient Egyptian history, horses remained a luxury and one of the most formidable weapons of the pharaoh's army. With the arrival of the Arabs in the 7th century and their equestrian tradition, horses became what they are now in Gurna, a sign of wealth and of masculine pride. It is dusk in Gurna, the time when the town comes alive. In these ordinarily calm streets, music fills the air. On a patio away from prying eyes, the men are continuing the wedding celebrations. The horse is still the guest of honor, only this time the rider has to show off his skills as a trainer. The horses dance alongside the men to the rhythm of tambourines and mizmars, which are an early form of trumpet. No party is complete in Egypt without a stick fight or tartib. This is an ancient tradition that comes from training the pharaoh's soldiers. This martial arts has very precise rules that were established in about 3200 BC. It is still practiced today. The first of the two fighters to graze the face of his opponent is declared the winner. Contact must remain symbolic and the fight must be simulated. Over the centuries, Tartib became more of a dance than a fight, shifting from a military register to a martial arts one, thanks to the practice of local farmers. In the early hours of the morning, the wedding celebrations are still in full swing. The men are starting to show signs of tiredness through the smoke from their shishas. Every morning, hot air balloons fly over the ancient site of Thebes. When the winds are favorable, lucky passengers get to see the biggest ancient temple of all, Karnak. It is home to one of the most important gods in ancient Egypt, Amon. Only priests can enter. Every day they lay offerings in front of Amon's statue, food to give him the energy he needed to unite the universe. But his energy is contagious, so Karnak has high walls to protect the uninitiated from contamination. For ancient Egyptians, Karnak was the equivalent of a nuclear power station, and the god Amon was the nuclear reactor. It was a useful place, but a dangerous one. 
We are now standing on the famous Sphinx Alley, a three kilometer long road linking Karnak and Luxor. This was the processional route taken by Ramesses II for the celebration of the Feast of Opet during the second month of the Nile floods in the inundation season. The Feast of Opet is one of the most important festivals in ancient Egypt. It celebrates the start of the Nile floods. This was the only time in the year when the priests would bring out statues of the gods. It was also the only opportunity for ancient Egyptians to see Amon. The god must be united with his wife, Mut. The pharaoh is present because he is the only person able to communicate directly with Amon. The union between Mut and Amon symbolizes fertility because the silt deposited by the river fertilizes vast areas of Egyptian soil every year. I am standing on Egyptian soil that dates back to 1100 to 1200 BC, era of Ramesses II. But if you look at the lower part of the mosque, at the level of the door there, that was built in the 12th century AD. So, 2,500 years later, or a bit less even, because the temple was still in use in Roman times. So, less than a thousand years later, this part of the temple was covered in mud six meters deep. Clearing the temple led to a rediscovery of this jewel of ancient Egypt, but the original entrance to the mosque had to be ditched and then transformed into a window with an unrestricted view over the great court of Ramesses II. In ancient Egypt, the floods marked the start of the calendar year. As with so many events at the time of the pharaohs, the date was decided by the Nile. 150 kilometers upstream at the temple of Kom Ombo. The proof is etched into the stone for anyone who knows how to read hieroglyphs. Samir certainly does. He is a Copt. This Christian community was present in Egypt long before the Arab conquest in 640 AD. Copts are direct descendants of ancient Egyptians. Samir owes his passion for Egyptology to his desire to gain a better understanding of his origins. Part of the answer is to be found on the walls of Komombo in the form of this perfectly preserved calendar. The dates were dictated by the Nile and its caprices, and the calendar is still used by the Coptic Church and by many Egyptians. The same calendar is still followed by farmers in Egypt, and it is also the liturgical calendar of the Coptic Church. Ancient Egyptians invented this 365-day calendar, or to be exact, this 360-day calendar plus five feast days at the end of the year. The 365 days are divided into 12 months of 30 days each and the 12 months were spread over three seasons, the inundation, the emergence, and the harvest. The ancient Egyptian calendar started in mid-July, around the time of the Nile floods. Let me show you an example. This is the first day of the third month of the season of the inundation, and this is the second day and the third day, and so on. This is the calendar we've inherited. Modern-day calendars have 365 days a year, so they were invented by the ancient Egyptians. The Nile has always organized the lives of Egyptians down to the smallest details. But in addition to being a life force, the river is synonymous with danger. And at the time of the pharaohs, anything that represented a threat was turned into a deity. Komombo is the house of Sebek, the god with the head of a crocodile. He is the protector of the Nile, but he is also a troublemaker who had to be appeased at all costs. 
At Komombo, archaeologists found hundreds of crocodile mummies, proof of an ancient cult. Quite a few crocodile remains were found in the necropolis. Some of them are huge, very important. The ancient Egyptians didn't deify or worship the whole species, just an individual crocodile, chosen according to specific criteria. And that crocodile was considered to be a living god. It was pampered and fed honey pastries. It was presented with crowns of flowers. It really was treated like a god. Then, then when it died, it was mummified like a god. The Nile used to be full of crocodiles and it was dangerous for Egyptians to bathe in it back then, given how many of them were lurking in its waters. Today, there are hardly any crocodiles left on the banks of the Nile, but another animal continues to terrorize and command the respect of locals. This animal can be seen on numerous ancient carvings. It is the cobra, and it acted as a bodyguard to the pharaoh when it was in attack mode. Both now and then, the best way to spot a cobra is to go to a busy neighborhood and look for a snake charmer, or rather, a snake hunter. That is how Atef makes his living, like his father before him and his father's father before that. He captures unwanted snakes from houses or out in the fields and then trains them to entertain bystanders. It's a very sought after job because these snakes end up in people's houses. As soon as people spot one, they call me. I'm the only snake charmer left around here. As soon as I catch them, I put them in a basket like this. They live in these baskets until they die. They die of natural causes. I don't kill them. I couldn't do that. Obviously, the first thing I do is remove their fangs. Then I put them in front of me like this to get them used to me. And then I start training them. It's very simple. If they try to escape, I catch hold of their tail and put them back in front of me until they get used to me and stop trying to escape. I was only bitten once when catching a snake. The bite completely paralyzed my finger, and I had to have surgery on it. My finger remained stuck in this position. I had an operation to straighten it out, and it went back to normal. It was a cobra that did that to me, one like this, the same species, but that one was more aggressive and very wild. Plus, it was much fatter. No problem. That's what the kiss. Wild animals weren't the only danger faced by the ancient Egyptians. The Nile is a capricious river. When the floodwaters got out of control, they destroyed everything in their wake. The temple of Kom Ombo still bears the scars. The temple looks complete, but in actual fact, the front is missing. On this side, you have the outer wall, but there is only one door jam. 
You have to imagine a door there and the outer wall built of mud bricks, which continued along there. It was carried away by the Nile. This is a blatant example of the violence of the Nile and its floodwaters. Of course, the Nile has a nourishing side to it. But in the case of severe flooding, it can be very destructive and dangerous. In times of heavy flooding, the Nile swept up and often destroyed everything in its midst. Sometimes the riverbed didn't return to its original level. It would change on a whim. To protect themselves from the river's worst extremes, the Egyptians would build mud brick walls. Karnak Temple, for example, is surrounded by a gigantic dike. Building it was a humongous task, which must have taken the pharaoh's brickmakers several centuries to complete. You can see them here, with their tools in this bas-relief. To gain a better understanding of the techniques involved, we visit a modern-day brickmaker. Abdallah Salem and his colleagues make bricks, and their methods haven't changed since the time of the pharaohs. The first stage is to mix earth, straw and water. Next, we pour the mixture into rectangular moulds, line them up, and then leave them to dry in the sun. People grow up learning this profession, and when they die, someone else takes up the torch and history repeats itself. We must protect our heritage. We make between 1,000 and 1,100 bricks a day. Look at these, for example. The first stage is finished. These are unfired bricks, and some people use them like this. But other people prefer fired bricks. It's up to individuals to choose what they want to build their house with. In our village, Everybody uses unfired bricks because they are much better adapted to our climate. Fired bricks don't fare so well in very hot weather. The Nile floods would mobilize the entire population of Egypt under the pharaohs. It was a constant source of worry. Further south, towards the modern city of Aswan, there was an obstacle on the river, the first cataract. This collection of rocks would disappear and reappear, depending on the water level. Elephantine Island is one of the biggest islands in the first cataract. To get there, Samer boards a traditional Nile river boat. We are on board a felucca. A felucca is a traditional Egyptian sailing boat. The Nile has been Egypt's main through fare since the time of the ancient Egyptians. Sailing was the most comfortable and fastest way to travel. The prevailing wind in Egypt is a northerly wind, which blows the boats against the current. The Nile's current goes from south to north in the opposite direction to the wind, which is what makes it possible to sail in both directions. Elephantine Island was essential for military operations in ancient Egypt. From here, 
They could watch over the Nile, prevent invasions from the south by boat, and control the ivory trade, after which the island is named. The island isn't just located in an important strategic position. It is also the first point of reference for monitoring the floods. The measuring system the pharaohs used remained in place until the 20th century and can be found all along the river, as far north as the delta. We are in a nilometer on Elephantine Island. This nilometer was used until relatively recently to measure flood levels. These are the graduations from the 19th century, the Muslim era. And on the left, you have the graduations from the time of the pharaohs. So, when the flood waters rose, they flowed in here and gradually filled the millimeter. The priests used these graduations to estimate the force of the flood water and the speed at which it would rise. If there was too much water, they had to build shelters. And if there was not enough water, they had to dig ponds to retain as much of it as possible. It was a vital and very important role of the king of Egypt to manage the floodwaters of the Nile and to regulate water supplies for the crops. In ancient Egypt, everything was thought to be connected to the deities. If there was a bad flood, it was because Khnum was unhappy. Khnum, with his ram's head, is one of the most important gods in the Egyptian pantheon. His name means master of the water, and he controls the Nile floods. Khnum resides on Elephantine Island, which is the focal point of his kingdom, the first cataract. The cataracts are the rocks, mostly granite, which covered this whole region back in the day. The Nile has carved out a path through them. You have to imagine this region in the season of inundation, with the water swirling between all these rocks. In ancient Egyptian mythology, this was the source of the Nile. If Khnum is the god of the Nile's floods, Hapi was the god of its source. He lives on the riverbed, in a cave under the cataract. Water spurts out of a jar in his hands. Happy embodies the benevolent aspect of the Nile. He is portrayed as an androgynous figure with a bust and a belly. Happy personifies fertility. When he is with his double, he represents the link between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, between the papyrus and the lotus. The Nile's floodwaters no longer reach the first cataract. A few kilometers upstream from Elephantine Island, a concrete and steel monstrosity is blocking the way, bringing this capricious river under control. The Aswan Dam has usurped Khnum, the god of the floods. At over four kilometers long and 111 meters high, the dam is a match for the Great Pyramid, taking up 17 times more space. Since it was built in 1970, this giant structure has transformed Egypt. Today, Egyptian farmers have three harvests a year, instead of just one, but there is a price to pay. Chemical fertilizers have replaced the silt from the flood waters. Nowadays, the Aswan Dam is a tourist attraction. It is a source of pride for Egyptians and for those who built it. Roshti was just 22 when he was recruited to work on this vast building site. I was here 55 years ago, so you can imagine the feelings I have now. Let you imagine the shape of the environment at that time. You see this place, actually, I mean, at that time it wasn't clean and uh, marvelous like this. It was hills and valleys of sand and rocks and all of that. This was our offices. We 
we found ourselves in 1960, the beginning of the high dam and the beginning of what we call it changing the mood of the Egypt itself, actually. From a small country to a country which has the goodwill to start building something like the high dam. That's why I, I like to talk about the high dam. It's not because an engineering sense, but I'm talking about the uh, psychological meaning about it. In the 1960s, Nasser ruled Egypt. A fervent defender of Arab nationalism, he wanted to proclaim the independence of his country to the whole world. The Aswan Dam became his great achievement. The United States refused to fund it, so Nasser appealed to the Soviet Union and was successful. Work started in 1960. 36,000 workers toiled day and night in temperatures sometimes exceeding 55 degrees. There were numerous accidents. The official number of victims was over 500. We had a lot of sacrifices. We had a lot of people dying on this project, actually. But the conclusion in, in, the, in the end of it, actually, that we are standing there now seeing that this project is living among all of us. Abdel Karim worked on the dam and survived. He was born and bred in Aswan. At the age of 91, the dam remains the biggest adventure of his life. Long live Egypt. Long live Egypt. Long live Egypt. Now I can talk to you about the dam. When construction started, I was working on a dangerous site. Everything collapsed on top of the workers, and lots of people were killed. Work was halted, and the biggest machines were banned from the site. We had to continue by hand using shovels. It took all our strength to lift the big stones with ropes. Yes, people died, but it was for a good cause, the Aswan Dam. Ah. This is the letter that Gamal Abdul Nasser sent me once the dam was finished. It's a thank you letter. I'm proud of my contribution. I'm glad I helped build the Aswan Dam. I did it for Egypt. Upstream from Aswan, the construction of the dam has had a drastic consequence, the creation of Lake Nasser, a vast reservoir of water covering an area of over 500 kilometers encompassing the entire region of Nubia. After thousands of years in existence, the monuments of Nubia are at risk from flooding. The most prestigious of all these archaeological treasures are the Abu Simbel temples. Richard Lebeau is a French Egyptologist. He found his calling at the age of 14 when he visited the Tutankhamun exhibition in Paris in 1967. Since then, he has traveled to Egypt over a hundred times. For Richard, Abu Simbel is still one of the most magical places in the world. In front of you, you have a monumental temple belonging to Ramesses II. It has a 20-meter high colossus. This was the first time a pharaoh had dared to represent himself as a god. This temple is a miracle. It almost disappeared under Lake Nasser. 42 nations came to the rescue with $36 billion just a week or two before disaster struck. 
The operation to save the Abu Simbel temples was launched on 1st of April 1964. It was a race against the clock. For eight years, 900 people worked on it day in, day out. First, they had to build a dike to protect the site from rising flood water. Then, workers divided Abu Simbel up into 1,035 blocks, each weighing 20 to 30 tons. The four seated giants and the six other monumental statues were dug out by hand. The most delicate phase could now begin. It involved transporting this giant jigsaw puzzle 64 meters upstream. Jacks, cranes, and extremely powerful winches were used to raise these huge blocks to the top of the cliff. Finally, artificial hills were built to recreate the original setting for the two Abu Simbel temples. This is an extraordinary site in terms of technique. Digging up a temple is highly risky and a real challenge. In those days, the world had no concept of universal heritage. It was saving the monuments of Nubia, including the Abu Simbel temples, which gave rise to UNESCO's famous list of World Heritage buildings. The first building on that list was Abu Simbel. This is the second temple of Abu Simbel, the one Ramesses II dedicated to his famous wife, Nefertiti. In addition to being a devoted lover, Ramesses II was a great politician. He knew that the prosperity of Egypt depended on his domination of Nubia. And at the bottom of this inscription that you see here, he is presented as the master of Nubia, today and always. Nubia was an important region for the pharaohs. It is rich in gold mines, and ivory and African slaves passed through here. The trouble was that the Nubians were inclined to rebel as soon as they got the chance. The pharaohs from northern Egypt tried everything to pacify this rebellious region. This is a column of prisoners their hands tied behind their back and on their knees. These people are easily identifiable by their negroid traits. The significance of this frieze, which was on the outside of the temple, was to show Egyptians that the Nubians had been conquered and that this defeat would affect them throughout history until the end of time. This World Heritage Site was saved, but the Nubian population was forgotten. There was no sign of the paradise NASA had promised them after the construction of the dam, and 100,000 of them were displaced. In the village of Abu Simbel, behind the artificial hills sheltering the temples, a few traces of this ancient culture can still be found. Vickery does all he can to preserve it. He once used to sing about this lost paradise. Now he is trying to preserve remnants of it. I am part of the last generation to have experienced Nubia back in the day. I used to play in front of the temples of Abu Simbel when the facades stretched down towards the river. We would travel by Feluca from our village on the opposite bank. We would come here to the temples to play. I have happy memories of it. The whole of Nubia was here. And that was the village of Abu Simbel, one of the 44 villages in Nubia, which stretched from the border with Sudan down to Aswan. The 44 villages in Nubia were dotted all along the Nile Valley. The landscape you see today between Luxor and Aswan remains more or less unchanged, just had more palm trees. There used to be millions of palm trees here but they have all disappeared 60 meters beneath the lake. 
No one can imagine what it was like. Today it is deserted. There is a lake here now. But life was different then. There were felucas on the Nile. That life has completely disappeared under the lake. UNESCO hasn't done much to save it, nor has the Egyptian government or anybody else for that matter. If we don't try to safeguard this part of our culture, it will disappear forever. Nubian culture is at risk of disappearing, and yet it has lasted for centuries. In particular, the architecture, with its domes and vaults designed especially to withstand the heat of the desert. The music is a reflection of the people too. Some of the instruments are straight out of the pharaonic era. Egypt has made the pharaoh's wish come true, to bring the Nile under control, whatever the price. Most Egyptians have had to adapt. Despite coming from the Delta, these fishermen at Lake Nasser look as if they've been here forever. However, a new element has appeared in the heart of the African continent. Ethiopia has also built a dam over the Nile. The Ethiopians can now control the flow of the river too, so the Egyptians are not the only masters of the Nile. This represents a new challenge for the country, where, since the time of the pharaohs, the Nile has been synonymous with Egypt, and Egypt has been synonymous with the Nile. Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. This fragment of nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendour of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. When they came to Egypt, they found the colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes, so they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. The cult of death played a crucial role in ancient Egypt. With its necropolises, pyramids, mummies and sarcophaguses, three quarters of archaeological discoveries on Egyptian soil are directly linked to funeral rites. The ancient Egyptians loved life so much that they hoped to be able to enjoy it. Even after their death, they would mummify themselves to make their bodies last forever. Their burial places were built like dwellings, with the walls painted in colours associated with life. But that was not enough. The deceased also had to appear before Osiris, the god of the dead, who would judge their actions and decide whether or not to grant them eternal life. This age-old notion of judgement after death has not disappeared. In Egypt, both Christians and Muslims hope to be among the chosen few when the final judgment comes. Today, as in the past, death is not seen as an end for believers.
In Luxor, the wedding season has begun. Couples marry in the shade of this ancient Egyptian temple. It is the start of summer, when temperatures rise to over 45 degrees centigrade. To protect themselves, people start work very early in the morning. This is the best time of day to spread the word. Trucks like these, with their makeshift loudspeakers, are often the only link between small, neighboring rural communities. Caliph Mahmud, Caliph Hassanan has departed. May he rest in peace through the mercy of God. He is from the village of Najer Seke. His burial will take place at three o'clock before afternoon prayers. I am announcing the death of a Muslim to villagers. I am making this announcement so that everyone in the surrounding villages knows that this person has died. If I don't announce it through the loudspeakers, no one will come to his funeral because no one will have been informed. I have been doing this for 25 years, but it is not my real job. My real job is to do the call to prayer at the mosque. I was chosen because I have a good voice. Allahu Akbar is my job. It is very important for people to join the funeral procession and pray for the dead. If they do, they will be rewarded by God. But it is important for the deceased too. As we say here, if 40 people pray for the deceased, they will definitely go to heaven. Khalaf Mahmud died in the night. In accordance with the Quranic tradition, he will be buried the following day. This man was held in high esteem. His friends gather outside his house to pay their last respects. <laughs> Inside, his family is watching over his corpse. In keeping with tradition, it has been wrapped in a white shroud. The adult males in the family have washed and embalmed the body. He is ready for his final journey to the village cemetery. If Caliph Mahmud had lived in the age of the pharaohs, he would have been mummified after his death. Mummification was a much more complicated process than embalming. The ancient Egyptians believed that there was life after death in their own bodies. To see mummies today, you have to travel to the capital. Most of them are to be found in Cairo. Hidden away in the center of this sprawling city, this old museum is their home. The museum's incredible collection still attracts just as many Egyptomaniacs as ever. But the undisputed stars of the museum are the mummies. Some are over 3,000 years old and incredibly well preserved. The bandages have been removed to show off the bodies. That practice dates back to the early days of Egyptology in the 19th century. Nowadays, 
Out of respect for their ancient religion, the mummies are left in their original state. At the museum's laboratory, not a day goes by without Professor Moerman, a distinguished specialist in the restoration of antiquities, handling the mummies. Once they're out of their sarcophagus, he never touches the cardboard casing. It is the final protection before the bandages. Here we have a mummy in a wooden case, shaped like a human body. Thanks to the funeral mask and the x-rays, we have been able to confirm that this is the mummy of a young woman. She was about 22 years old when she died. On the x-rays, we could also see that she had a fetus between her legs. So that tells us about the possible cause of death. Given her age, there is a strong possibility that she died of a miscarriage. The mummy is in perfect condition, as are the drawings on the case. Some are very rare. Here, for example, we have the god, Knum, standing in front of the young, dead girl. It is magnificent and very rare. The origins of mummification are due to chance. 6,000 years ago, Egyptians used to bury their dead in ditches in the desert. They noticed that the sand acted as a very good preservative. Later, their belief in eternal life forced them to find more effective processes to preserve the corpse in the best state possible. For the rich, balms, spices and bitumen were used. Once the entrails had been removed, corpses were soaked for 70 days in natron, which is a natural salt which absorbs humidity. All of these products cost an absolute fortune. This is another very rare piece. It is the left arm of a pharaoh, King Unas, from the 5th dynasty. It was discovered by French archaeologist Gaston Maspero at the end of the 19th century. Later, researchers carbon dated the arm. The results confirmed that it came from the Old Kingdom, from about 2350 BC. Daminations under the microscope revealed the presence of the resin and linen used during the mummification process. This is hard proof that mummification was already being practiced at that time. But the technique was not perfected until the days of the New Kingdom in the 18th and 19th dynasties. The techniques of mummification in the 19th dynasty were so effective that 3,200 years after their death, we can still put faces to the names of the major figures in Egyptian history. People like Seti I and his son Ramesses II, one of Egypt's most powerful pharaohs, who reigned for 67 years and died at over 90 years of age. The practice of mummification carried on for centuries and was adapted by all of Egypt's various invaders. We are working here on a very special mummy, a mummy with a portrait from the Roman era. These are called Fayum mummies, and they existed between the 1st and 5th centuries AD. This one is very special. It is drawn on a red background. There are only 20 like it in the world. The idea behind the funeral masks covering the faces of Egyptian mummies is that they restore the use of the senses to the dead person. At the end of the Old Kingdom, 
The masks were replaced with portraits that came straight out of the Greco-Roman artistic tradition. These portraits were commissioned from artists by the living in anticipation of certain death. It is hard to know exactly when mummification stopped, but there were no mummies between the 5th and 6th century AD. That date corresponds to the rise of monotheistic religions, which forbade this practice. In the region around Luxor, Caliph Mahmud's remains have reached their final resting place, the cemetery in his village. Only the men take part in the funeral procession. According to the Prophet Muhammad, the hyper-emotionalism of women and children would disturb the sobriety of the funeral. In the Muslim tradition, the burial must take place within 24 hours of death. This is a precaution which makes good sense at these latitudes. The corpse must be carried over a distance of four kilometers in temperatures of 45 degrees centigrade in the shade. There is only one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, chants the crowd, swelling as the procession reaches the corpse's final resting place. If the hills overlooking this tiny village cemetery could talk, they would tell us how little these rituals have changed. The Theban hills have seen thousands of funeral processions pass by since the days of the ancient Egyptians. With over 600 tombs recorded, you need a bit of help to find your way around. Sam and Michel is a tour guide. Whenever he comes to Luxor, he finds time to visit Amon's bookshop that specializes in Egyptology and is situated in the midst of the ancient ruins. I accompany groups and I guide them through Egypt. I try to pass my love of all things Egyptian onto them. You have to keep your knowledge up to date. There are new discoveries every year and new theories. This is my passion, so I try to stay up to date. To do that, I need books, and I need to read. Even for an avid reader, it would take several lifetimes to uncover all the secrets hidden in the Theban hills. To help make sense of it, Egyptologists have divided the necropolis into three parts. The Valley of the Nobles, the Valley of the Queens, and the Valley of the Kings. There are images of funeral processions on lots of graves. But Sama has decided to come to the Valley of the Nobles. With its monumental staircase, the tomb of Ramazé, a vizier under Amenhotep III and a Kenaton, is one of the largest in the area of the necropolis, reserved for nobles. At the back of the tomb, Sameh finds what he is looking for, an image of a funeral procession that is 3,000 years old. You can see the family members walking together behind the pallbearers. Next, you've got the bearers of the grave goods. Grave goods are the treasures that are placed in the tomb alongside the deceased. The deceased hopes to live the same life after death as they lived on Earth, only better and more carefree. So, they will need to eat and drink and entertain themselves. But they also keep the same job as they had on Earth. So, they will need the tools necessary for performing those functions. Here, for example, you can see a leopard skin which was the attire of a high priest. Ramazé was a high priest, so he needs a priest's robes. Then there is a bed, a mattress, a headrest, and some boxes. 
These eclectic grave goods had only symbolic value. They were purely functional. When Howard Carter opened up Tutankhamun's tomb in 1921, the world was amazed to discover the wealth of this young pharaoh, who died at the age of just 19. Nothing had been forgotten. Even his chariot was buried with him. In total, Carter unearthed 5,000 objects from the tomb, estimated to be worth the equivalent of a billion dollars. But in the great majority of cases, the grave goods have long disappeared from the tombs of the pharaohs, stolen by generations of grave robbers. And here we have the mourners. The mourners were very interesting. Here you see women showing their grief and their sorrow. You can see black tears on their cheeks. Their eyes were heavily made up with coal, so when they cried, the coal ran down their cheeks. The tradition for mourners hasn't completely disappeared from Egypt, but Islam forbids the expression of grief through loud wailing. Professional mourners resisted for a long time, but today it is only in remote villages that the tradition persists. This scene of a funeral procession is on the side wall of the vault. As you can see, it is dug out of the mountainside. This ramp leads down to the vault. The mummy and its grave goods were slid down the ramp and placed in the burial chamber. Today, as in ancient Egypt, after the funeral procession, the corpse is laid to rest. Kalaf Mahmoud's burial is over. It is time for the village imam to recite the prayer for the dead. The prayer reminds us that death is part of life and that the deceased will get his due reward on the day of the resurrection. The congregation stands to listen to this final oration. Throughout the centuries, from the Egypt of the pharaohs to that of Alexander the Great, funeral rites have continued to evolve. Islam, too, has undergone a transformation over the course of history. One city in Egypt that single-handedly embodies this mixture of genres is Alexandria. The city that was founded by Alexander the Great has retained its cosmopolitan character. Here, you see signs in many different languages, French, Greek, Arabic, and Italian. The city is a thriving Mediterranean port, so its five million inhabitants have watched people come and go since the days of antiquity. This melting pot of a city has always had its fans. People like Doa, a tour guide who specializes in Egyptology. When I was young, I often used to come here with my family during the summer holidays. We would spend our summer holidays on the beaches of Alexandria. The beaches have gone. Sadly, they are rapidly disappearing. The sea level is rising and concrete boulders are strewn on the beaches in an attempt to hold back the sea. I love Alexandria and I keep bringing tourists here. Sometimes Alexandria is not on their itinerary, but I always try to add it. Alexandria is steeped in history. Besides the lighthouse, which has disappeared, but was once one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, another archaeological treasure lies hidden in the heart of the city. Discovered in 1900 by accident, when the weight of a donkey caused the ground to cave in, the city's ancient catacombs revealed a whole other world, the world of the dead. It is accessed by a spiral staircase and is arranged over three levels. 35 meters underground, 
Visitors find themselves stepping back in time to the Egypt of the 1st to the 4th century AD with its cosmopolitan funeral customs. And here we are at the bottom of a well. It was down this shaft that the sarcophaguses containing corpses or mummies were lowered into the various levels of the catacombs. And this is where the digging stopped. The spiral staircase would have continued down here. But in 392 AD, all pagan cults were banned and Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. So digging was stopped because these rituals were no longer going to be practiced. The catacombs of Qom el Shokafa, to use their Arabic name, are a veritable maze. They contain over 300 Greco-Roman tombs, the majority of which are loculi. These burial niches are identical to those found in the catacombs in Rome. The tomb which best symbolizes this mixture of cults and rites is also the first one to be built here in the second century AD. Here we are in the original tomb where the catacombs began. That is the statue of a man. The body is Egyptian, but the head is Roman, with curly hair and everything. It shows a fusion of art and religion, which is very typical of that era. I'm talking about the second century AD. First, you've got these composite columns, which are typically Greek, and then over here, you've got this Agatha demon, which is typically Greek, but the double crown is Egyptian. And above it is a circle containing a medusa, which is for the protection of the tomb. According to Greek mythology, medusa has the power to turn anyone who looks at her to stone. Then the center is very Egyptian. Here you can see a winged sun with a cobra on either side of it. And then this line of cobras, which was very typical of the time and also a symbol of protection. Here we come to the main tomb. It was dug out of the rock along with the lid. The lid does not open. The burial was performed from the back, from outside the chamber. And here we have a carving of Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification, who was the guardian of the tombs. He is depicted here as a legionary in a Roman style that has nothing to do with Egyptian art. Today, as in the past, once the funeral is over, the family sits down together to eat. The architects of the catacombs thought of everything. This large, typically Roman room with its U-shaped bench serves as a dining room. The whole family would assemble here. You have to imagine a wooden table over there with waiters passing behind it. Family members would lie on their left-hand side to make room in their stomach so they could fill it to maximum capacity. It would have been wine to accompany the meal. The idea was to share one last meal with the spirit of the deceased. In ancient Egypt, it wasn't unheard of for the mummy to attend this last meal before returning to its grave. So that it could enjoy the spectacle and the feast, either the oldest son or a priest would perform the ritual of opening the mummy's mouth. It was a magic ceremony that would allow the deceased to breathe, eat, hear and see in the world of the dead. You were supposed to break the plates you had eaten off when you left the tomb. That is an Egyptian tradition which was practiced in the age of the pharaohs. The tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered thanks to the unearthing of pieces of pottery marked with his name. These had been used during the last meal his family ate with him before shutting up his tomb and leaving.
Muslims still hold funeral banquets, but there are certain conditions. Three days after Caliph Mahmud's burial, the period of mourning is officially over. The family can finally eat a meal in his honor. It takes place in the cemetery. It is a frugal and hasty repast with just one dish served. Caliph Mahmud's body now lies in the ground. His soul will be judged on the day of the resurrection at the end of this world, a last judgment that is customary of monotheistic religions. However, in ancient Egypt, the deceased were judged immediately. Once they were alone in their tomb, they would descend into the underworld to be judged. Their life would continue there, provided they passed several tests first and found a way to survive in the afterlife. That was no mean feat. At the small temple of Hathor in the Theban hills, Egyptians have inscribed instructions on the wall for the newly deceased. For the ancient Egyptians, death was just a way of passing from this world to the next. And for such a journey, people needed a guide to tell them about the different stages they would encounter. This is one of those stages. It's the weighing of the heart. It's in chapter 125 of the Book of the Dead. The heart is placed on one dish of the scales, and on the other dish there is a quill pen it is the quill pen of Mart, the goddess of justice, and the heart had to be as light as the feather. The scales had to balance. If the heart was as light as a feather, that meant the deceased had a clear conscience and could enter the field of reeds, which was the ancient Egyptians' equivalent of paradise. The weighing process is presided over by the god Osiris. If the heart is found to be heavier than the feather, then it will be eaten by a beast known as the devourer. And then the deceased really is dead. Being dead means not being able to continue living in the afterlife. The deceased, depending on their means, had a papyrus placed alongside them in their grave. It was a guide to their journey. Having their guide with them gave them peace of mind. It gave them the formulas they needed to overcome all the obstacles they were going to encounter along the way. For the dead to take a survival guide with them into the underworld, they needed a medium for those written instructions that was easy to carry. Over 5,000 years ago, the ancient Egyptians invented papyrus. The papyrus plant was the emblem of Lower Egypt. Images of papyrus plants were often seen on the walls of temples and tombs. This aquatic plant grew wild in the Nile Delta. Today, it is still grown by some farmers, but harvesting it is not easy. This type of farming is hard to mechanize. The farmers harvest it by hand, their feet in the water. For Sabi and his son Mohammed, it's hard work. Mohammed, bring the cart. These scenes look so timeless. In reality, the cultivation of papyrus completely disappeared from Egypt in the Middle Ages. And yet, papyrus had been a luxury product that Egyptians had a monopoly over throughout the Roman Empire until it was supplanted by parchment. Today, and this is very recent, it can be found in some fields again. Papyrus is a plant that the ancient Egyptians grew long before us. There was nothing much growing on this land, just some very standard crops. But a few years ago, we decided to plant papyrus again. In the 1970s, some Egyptian botanists started to show an interest in this plant. Legend has it that they reintroduced it after bringing home some plants they found deep in the heart of neighboring Sudan. Once the plant had been reintroduced, 
the farmers had to revive the methods of the ancient Egyptians to transform it into a material you could write on. I'm just cutting up the papyrus stems, which will be used to make the sheets of paper. I am cutting them into different lengths to allow us to make sheets of different sizes. Now, I'm slicing the stems with a fishing line. I judge everything by eye. The slices need to be identical, more or less the same thickness. The thinner they are, the more beautiful the paper will be. Once they have been moistened, the strips of papyrus need to be aligned and carefully placed on top of one another, so that there are no holes in the sheet. It is a job that demands a lot of dexterity. Doing this, I realized that the technique the ancient Egyptians invented was incredibly sophisticated. For me, with modern methods at my disposal, it's less hard. But for them, it must have been very complicated. No one knows the exact process the ancient Egyptians used to make papyrus. Did they use a press like Sabi? It's hard for archaeologists to answer that question. But Sabi's papyrus looks identical to the papyrus that the ancient Egyptians place in their sarcophaguses. Look how solid this leaf of papyrus is. You can fold it and unfold it again, no problem, it won't break. It is more solid than a sheet of normal paper. And what's more, it is light and transparent. I sell these sheets to printers or to artists who decorate them and sell them to tourists. Painting on papyrus takes a very special kind of skill. Artists who do it, like Ahmed, are real experts. Drawing on papyrus is harder than drawing on traditional paper. Because you can't just rub it out and start again. Having worked as the official artist on a number of archaeological digs, he turned to this discipline, which took him back to ancient Egyptian times. I am not an archaeologist, but I can tell you about the art of the ancient Egyptians. They used deep colors and applied several layers of paint. That is why their paintings are so magnificent. They used natural pigments, not chemicals like we use today. They loved bright colors and fixed them properly to the wall. The drawing was very precise. I am interested in all of that, in their line drawings, the fixing process and the pigments. And I try to imitate their art as far as it is possible to do so. Colour was very important for the ancient Egyptians. Their temples were completely covered with paintings, giving them a garish aspect that they no longer have today. 
The reason for this was that the pharaoh's subjects were illiterate. They had to be able to recognize the gods at first sight from their colors and costumes. Osiris was painted green, the color of spring, to show that he had overcome death. These painted representations are not lacking in realism, as shown in the difference in the skin color of the two sexes. The men are brown because they lived outdoors, and the women are yellow because they stayed shut up indoors. The animals, too, are represented in a way that is very true to reality. They will be used by the deceased in the afterlife. Who would want to eat a pale imitation of a Nile perch? Applying thick paint like this tires your hand out. It's not easy imitating the ancient Egyptians. But it's fascinating work. And I derive a lot of pleasure from it. Painters, stonecutters, and sculptors occupied an important role in ancient Egypt. In the Theban hills in the Middle Kingdom, they even had their own village, Deir el Medina. All the artisans lived together here, building tombs for the pharaohs in the nearby valley. Their own tomb reflect their craft too. They are topped with little pyramids, imitating early royal tombs. A symbol of ancient Egypt, the three pyramids of Giza were erected during the Old Kingdom in about 2600 BC. Back then, only the pharaoh had access to eternal life. The pyramid was a sort of launching pad for his soul to join the stars. But paradise gradually became accessible to everyone. Every Egyptian could have a pyramid built in line with their means. At Deir el Medina, Senegem, chief artisan to Ramesses II, didn't hold back when it came to constructing a tomb for himself. He topped his with a pyramid and paintings worthy of royalty. Sama's favorite thing here is the painting of paradise done by Senegem and his contemporaries. What is so distinctive about this tomb are these vignettes from the Book of the Dead. This one is of what we call the Fields of Aru, which is what ancient Egyptians hoped to find in the afterlife. Namely very fertile fields, where the wheat grows to heights of 3.5 meters and the flax is 2 meters tall. It's a place of abundance. We see them here, working in the fields. That will be one of their jobs in the afterlife. On Earth, they had to dig canals and build dikes and so on. And in the afterlife, it's exactly the same. And so they invented a system to spare themselves this drudgery. These funerary statues were known as Ushabati. They had a magic spell cast on them to make them act on behalf of the deceased and go to work in their place. You cannot compare heaven, as we think of it, with today's mentality to the way it was perceived 4,000 years ago. For the ancient Egyptians, heaven was a place of transition from life on earth to the afterlife, which was everlasting and carefree. The Egyptians believed in heaven, but they also believed that the dead came back to visit the living. The Ba embodies the soul of the deceased. It is represented by a bird with a human head. 
The bar is a sort of double for the deceased that is set free after death. Like a ghost, it leaves the tomb and flies over the deceased's favorite places, allowing it to participate in life outside the tomb. Then the bar flies back into the tomb and settles on the mummy. In modern-day Egypt, it is more the living who visit the dead than vice versa. Egyptians often pay their respects to their dearly departed. But the resting places of the dead are sometimes disrupted by daily life, especially in the country's capital. The population density is 10 times higher than in London. The population has forced many inhabitants out to the city cemeteries. The people of Cairo are used to this strange cohabitation. It is not unusual for them to use a grave as a tea tray or a washing line. life has developed around these tombstones. Hassan is a glassblower and he lives in this working class district. No one bats an eyelid on seeing this artisan working here. His workshop opens directly onto one of the graves. Hassan's family has lived in this cemetery for several generations. He is familiar with the habits of all his neighbors both the living and the dead. That's Hassan Arabesque's tomb, and Hassan Arabesque is me. Hassan has built his own tomb on the family plot near to his parents' grave. It is not unusual for Egyptians to build their tombs while they are still alive, just like in the days of the pharaohs. Personally, I have no problem with death. If I look back, I have lived a good and full life. I have restored my ancestors too, and my children will be proud of what I have achieved. What's more, it's handy. My tomb is a mere stone's throw from my house, but I have to admit, it's nicer here than where I live now. Obviously, not everyone wants to live in a cemetery, but if you fall on hard times and you need somewhere for your family to live, especially your children, at least you can always move here. You get used to living among the dead. In ancient Egypt, the afterlife was not always as peaceful as it is now. At the bottom of the Valley of Kings, in the Theban hills, generations of grave robbers, attracted by the buried treasures, came to disturb the resting places of the dead. But the Pharaoh I from the 18th dynasty was the victim of another form of tomb raiding. He was subjected to a campaign of damnation because of a rather troublesome forefather. Akhenaton, the pharaoh who was hostile to the god Amon and a heretic in the eyes of some of his successors. I paid dearly for his kinship with the accursed pharaoh. His tomb was methodically ransacked. 
You don't need to be a great detective to see that King Ai was murdered in his tomb. The heart has been removed from these images of him. And don't forget that the heart is the conscience. The penis, too, preventing him from reproducing and the face, which is his identity, so that he is no longer recognizable, then the hands, and so on and so forth. And so this mutilated king no longer exists because the ancient Egyptians believed in the magic power of the image. If the image of the deceased was intact, they existed. But if it was erased, they ceased to exist. The idea was to kill Ai, even after his death, to erase all trace of his existence. Even in his tomb, now he will never be reunited with his soul. When his soul returns to his tomb, he will no longer be there. Only then is he really dead. As you can see, they have hammered out the name of the king, which was written on this cartouche. The ancient Egyptians believed in the magic power of the word as well as of the image. Erasing his name meant that he no longer existed, so he was killed one more time. They hammered out the name, but they didn't succeed in eradicating him completely. 3,000 years later, I'm still saying the name I, and so he exists. His name lives on, and so those who tried to kill him failed. Zamek can name this pharaoh who died 3,000 years ago thanks to the work of archaeologists. By solving the mystery of the hieroglyphs and identifying the mummies they discovered, they have ensured eternal life for the ancient Egyptians. But they are not the only ones. The whole world has contributed. From visitors to the Egyptian Museum to tourists in the souk in Luxor, everyone is contributing to the eternal life of the pharaoh's subjects. And never mind that the pharaoh who has benefited the most from the helping hand of fate is one of the least important pharaohs in the history of Egypt. He died at the age of 19, and his power was very limited. And yet, not a minute goes by without someone somewhere in the world mentioning the name Tutankhamun. The most short-lived of the pharaohs will have enjoyed the most enduring posterity. Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. The fragment of nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises, and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendor of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. When they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes, so they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. Ancient Egypt gave the world its most extraordinary monuments. Its 3,500-year-long history was brought to a brutal end with the triumph of Christianity in the 4th century. But this extraordinary civilization did not disappear for all that. In the 19th century, when Jean-Francois Champollion solved the mystery of ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, Architecture, necropolises, shipbuilding, 
and the Coptic language of Egyptian Christians all have their roots in this ancient history. Modern Egypt is the daughter of ancient Egypt. The city of Cairo, with its 16 million inhabitants, stretches as far as the eye can see. In this month of June, despite the sweltering heat, the fog of pollution hanging over it seems less thick than usual. It is the middle of Ramadan, and the city is operating at a slower pace. There are just a few people out shopping for provisions getting what they need for when they can break their fast at dusk. Around 95% of Egyptians are Muslim. Islam is everywhere. It is part of everyday life. Witness the crowd assembled at the foot of the Al Hussein Mosque in the city center. Thousands of worshippers are gathered there, waiting for evening prayers. The meals have already been dished out. Everyone is waiting for the call from the muezzin. Once he has said Allahu Akbar for the third time, fasting ends and iftar begins. <laughs> These scenes may seem timeless, but the Muslim religion didn't arrive in Egypt until 640 AD. In the grand scheme of this ancient civilization, that's relatively recent. Its cultural roots lie in far more ancient fertile ground. It is a very visible heritage. In Giza, on the outskirts of Cairo, the ancient Egyptians built what the rest of the world still considers to be the emblem of the city, the pyramids. These vast tombs were built during the Old Kingdom over 4,500 years ago. They are real architectural feats. The Pyramid of Cheops is 147 meters high. It is the highest in Egypt and the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world to have withstood the test of time. The Pyramid of Khafre is almost as high. The site of the pyramids has been visited by millions of tourists since ancient times, but also numerous heads of state. Doha is a French-speaking tour guide. She got the chance to give Francois Mitterrand and Jacques Chirac a guided tour. Whether you are a president, a head of state, or a simple worker, the pyramids never cease to fascinate. The first foreigner to visit the pyramids and to describe them was Greek. He is known as the father of history. That was Herodotus in 430 BC. The word pyramid, now used to describe these monuments, comes from the Greek word pyramis. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramis. When they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes. So they gave them the same name, and the pyramid shape is itself sacred because it mimics the sun's rays, which cover the earth in the form of a pyramid. That's why the king, who is considered to be the incarnation of the sun on earth, wanted to be buried inside this sacred shape. The right to be buried in a pyramid was reserved for pharaohs and their wives. Even princes and princesses didn't have that right. However wealthy they were, they were still buried in what we now call mastabas. In Giza, the guardian of the pyramids is just as famous as its protégés. The Sphinx has watched over these royal graves for over 2,500 years. This lion with a human head is 74 meters long and 20 meters high. It's a pretty dissuasive protector. Yeah. 
We are standing between the paws of this famous sphinx, whose facial features are those of Khafre, who built the second pyramid. This pink granite stele between the sphinx's paws commemorates a dream Thutmose IV had in the 16th century BC. The Sphinx is embedded in the sand, and Futmosa was chasing desert animals. He fell asleep in the shade of the Sphinx's head and dreamed that the Sun God had appeared to him and spoken to him, saying, if you get me out of the sand, I promise you the throne. He woke up and told the story to the priest who believed him and started digging the Sphinx out of the sand. That's proof that the Sphinx was continually being embedded in sand and then dug out again. It was also dug out in the time of the Greeks and the time of the Romans. And when Christianity became the official religion of Egypt, this site, like any other site, became a pagan site and was completely neglected, so the Sphinx was buried in the sand again, and that's what protected it. The Copts were the first to start mutilating the Sphinx's face, and then the Arabs followed suit there is a legend or a story which says that during the Mamluk dynasty, Saim al-Dar thought the Sphinx was a pagan statue. He came and mutilated the Sphinx's face and broke its nose. It wasn't Obelix who broke it. Today, the Sphinx is still the world's biggest sculpture to be carved from a single block of stone. But building the pyramids required millions of blocks of stone. Some came directly from the Giza Plateau, whereas others came from a quarry that is still visible today. About 10 kilometers from the pyramids, on the outskirts of Cairo, the Makartam Hills still bear the scars of being used as quarries by the pharaohs. Some stones came from much further away, thanks to a natural transport link, the Nile. 700 kilometers south of Cairo, the city of Luxor, formerly known as Thebes in the days of the pharaohs, is also home to a gigantic monument. Karnak Temple, like the pyramids, took an impressive number of stones to build. It is the largest religious complex from antiquity and covers a surface area of two square kilometers. Working alongside their Egyptian counterparts, a team of French archaeologists are reconstructing parts of the temple under the direction of stonecutter and restorer Antoine Garrick. The statue of Tutankhamun has been here for about 3,500 years and has seen better days. It is cracked, we don't know why, and it is missing certain elements. No doubt after being toppled or looted, but what remains is incredibly good condition. The missing piece of nose was found nearby 10 years ago during a dig and was stuck back on again. Soon we're going to take the statue down to replace the missing parts that have been patched up with cement. That was done in 1912, I think. They used what they had at their disposal at the time. It's a prominent statue of a famous king in the middle of Karnak Temple. So it's an interesting project, and it's important for the history of the site and for Egyptians that this statue is exhibited in the best condition possible. We're going to take the whole thing apart to replace these two missing parts with beautiful carved blocks of new stone, recreating the original form of the statue. The restoration of this statue is designed to be completely reversible should the missing parts of Tutankhamun 
happened to be found one day. Work has already begun on the restoration of the pharaoh's torso and his left leg. Antoine Garrick is working on a block of sandstone that is very similar to the sort used in antiquity. It's a soft stone that could be carved in ancient times without the use of iron tools. Iron only arrived in about 600 BC. Before that, the sandstone could easily be carved using wooden mallets and bronze tools. The work I'm doing obviously uses modern-day tools. We could have had fun doing it with ancient tools, but it would have taken 10 times as long. That's known as experimental archaeology, and it's done with a specific goal in mind. That isn't the goal of this operation. To get the finish on the sandstone, you can simply use another piece of sandstone. When it's dry, it works very well. The two stones abrade one another, and you get this fine dust, a very smooth finish. As you can see, it's very effective. I might carve the stone with modern tools, but I finish it off with this to give it the exact same finish as on an ancient statue. Antoine's team is working on the statues, but it is also responsible for restoring the walls in the secret courtyard in the middle of Karnak Temple, whose decorations date from the times of Thutmose III. The team has already reconstructed the east wall, and now they're tackling the north wall. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle with blocks of stone weighing several tons. Antoine is assisted by Mohammed, an Egyptian stonecutter who was trained by him. I've been doing this job for 10 years now, and I still have a lot to learn. I don't think I'll finish my apprenticeship before I die, even. There is nothing nobler than working with stone. There is so much to learn. It's humbling. I know I'm still a beginner in this profession. In Egypt, there have been so many archaeological discoveries that stonecutters have several generations worth of work ahead of them. But some of the buildings that seem to be complete at first sight are actually very incomplete. The three big pyramids are a good example. None of them has retained their peak. This is the Pyramidion, which is meant to go on top of the pyramid. This block of stone is original. It was found buried in the sand during a dig, and it is the tip of the pyramid. On the pyramid of Khafre, you can see a substantial part of the cladding. It has lost its tip, but you can still imagine what these pyramids look like when they were complete. They must have been beautiful and impressive. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine the initial impact of the Great Pyramids. They must have been majestic, clad in sparkling white and perfectly smooth. But for the past 4,500 years, they have lost some of their splendor, like most monuments from the pharaonic era. Jean-Francois Champollion, the great French Egyptologist, came to Egypt in around 1830. It is estimated that 70% of what he saw and described at the time has now completely disappeared. The reasons are multiple. Erosion, earthquakes, the Nile floods, and especially human intervention. For years, the pyramid was used as a quarry, and that's unfortunately how it lost its cladding. The cladding disappeared along with a large part of the base. Muhammad Ali, king of Egypt in the 19th century, was very proud of himself for having built a dam north of Cairo using the cladding from these pyramids. Successive generations have come and helped themselves to these pharaonic monuments, 
Even in ancient times, some pharaohs reused the monuments of their predecessors. Then the Greeks, Romans, and Christians also got their stone supplies from these ancient relics, Egyptians. The majesty of Muslim Egypt was also built using debris from the pharaonic reign. In Cairo, the founder of the Mamluk dynasty in the 14th century had a huge tomb built. This mausoleum might never have seen the light of day without the involuntary help of the ancient Egyptians. This is a blatant example of ancient stones being reused in the Mamluk era. You can see the sun god at the top of the cartouche. It's not incidental that the cartouche is on the ground. Coming from the pagan era, it was put there deliberately to be trampled over. The ancient Egyptians were in the habit of trampling over anything they didn't like, placing it underfoot. Modern Egyptian people say, I'm going to walk all over you, meaning, I'm going to flatten you. And they flattened everything that came from the pharaonic era. Barkuk had this mausoleum built at the height of his reign. The Mamluks arrived here in the 9th century AD. Often originating from the Caucasus, these emancipated slaves were trained in the military arts to serve Muslim sovereigns. Under Barkuk, they came to power for the second time in the history of Egypt in 1382 and gave the country 49 sultans until their downfall in the 19th century. This is the mausoleum of Sultan Barkouk. The mausoleum is a rather impressive prayer room. It was built for the Sultan and lies above a cave in which he was later buried. Islam forbids the use of sarcophaguses and coffins, so the body was wrapped in a shroud and placed in an underground chamber. The monuments we see here are just simple gravestones. In the pharaonic era, ancient Egyptians had a series of underground burial chambers built in their mastabas. The Mamluks did the same with their mausoleums. The mausoleum of Sultan Barkuk is the biggest tomb in Cairo, covering a surface area of over 4,500 square meters. Rather than just a simple grave, it is a complex design to house a school with living quarters and a place for worship. The mosque still hosts anonymous burials for those seeking some of the renown of the great Mamluk Sultan. When you climb to the top of the minarets, you get an idea of the influence Barkuk had on this part of Cairo. We are in the cemetery in Cairo. He was among the first to build his mausoleum here. At first, this cemetery was used to house just the Sultan's mausoleums. Then Sultan Barkouk moved the donkey station from the foot of the citadel to get people to come here to pray for him. Donkeys were the only means of transport for people at the time. If the main station was too far away, people wouldn't come here. Today, five centuries later, because we are in the middle of the cemetery, we can see people and tombs left, right and centre. And these are not just the Sultan's tombs, but the tombs of all the inhabitants of Cairo. And as you can see, the dead and the living live together in harmony. The cemetery surrounding the mausoleum of Sultan Barkuk is vast. It occupies a large part of eastern Cairo. The authorities estimate that half a million people live in the city of the dead. 
The living have adapted to this very original neighborhood. They have no choice. Overpopulation and a hike in rents has pushed many people out to the cemeteries of Cairo. This resettlement is made easier by the fact that the city of the dead is laid out like a proper town with streets, avenues and squares. <laughs> These modern necropolises, literally cities of the dead in Greek, are reminiscent of those seen at the foot of the pyramids of Giza, dating from around 3500 BC. Here we are in the necropolis behind the pyramid of Cheops, built for the dignitaries who lived during his reign. They wanted to live their second life under his reign too, so they asked to be buried behind their master's pyramid. It was a town with crisscrossing streets that were a hive of activity. There were people coming to present their offerings to the dead. Then there were the stonecutters, the builders of mastabas, the painters, the tomb sculptors, and the embalmers. A whole population lived and worked here, rubbing shoulders with the dead who were already buried underground. As well as being formidable architects, the ancient Egyptians passed on other important legacies to modern Egypt. In 1950, archaeologists discovered a 150 meter long cavity at the foot of the Great Pyramid. It housed a 4,500 year old ship, carefully dismantled into 1,224 pieces by the ancient Egyptians. It took 10 years to put it back together again. Today, visitors can admire Cheops' solar ship, close to where it was discovered. This ship is linked to the burial rites of pharaonic Egypt. It informs us of the sophisticated technological prowess of Egyptians at the time of the early pharaohs. The solar ship is 43 meters long, weighs 45 tons, and was built without the use of nails or screws. The planks were lashed together using rope. The water tightness of the hull was assured by the fact that wood expands in water and rope retracts, drawing the planks of wood tighter together. This simple and ingenious system of shipbuilding is what made Egypt great uniting this vast country along its main transport axis, the Nile. Traces of this shipbuilding tradition are still evident today. In Rosetta, on the Nile Delta on the Mediterranean, this legacy lives on. Not a day goes by without a boat being launched. In Rosetta, there are about 35 boatyards. It is an ancient local tradition. We've always done it. We don't learn how to build boats from books, but we've all seen our parents do it. In their day, they made small fishing boats and cargo ships. Nowadays, the shipbuilding industry here is more about big yachts or tourist boats. The shipbuilders in Rosetta have adapted to the demand. Most of the boats they build are made of steel, but whenever they can, they work with the same material as their ancient ancestors, wood. This is my wooden boat. I'm having it built for myself because I want to keep up the traditions. I want people to continue using wood. It's a material that has a soul. I grew up with wood. I watched my parents and grandparents use it. I really missed it, so I decided to have a wooden boat made. In 
I dream of setting sail in this boat, going fishing, going on trips, going on holiday. God willing, it will soon be ready, and then I'm off. In the daytime during Ramadan, the shipbuilding activity slows down. At night, once people have broken their fast, Rosetta resumes its intense activity to the rhythm of welders and shipbuilders. But Rosetta's world renown has nothing to do with its sailors and fishing boats. It owes its fame to a single steely, the Rosetta Stone, which helped solve one of archaeology's greatest mysteries, deciphering hieroglyphs. It was found in the citadel of Kite Bay in 1799. Kamis has been guarding the entrance for over 25 years. He knows every nook and cranny and every stone of this fort. The stronghold was where the soldiers lived and where ammunition was stored. But you see these pharaonic columns and that block of stone over there. There are ancient relics like that all over the fort. During his campaign in Egypt, Napoleon made this Mamluk fortress a vital strategic point. It allowed him to control access to the Nile and to stop the English from attacking. In 1799, the French began to restore it. They didn't expect to uncover the key to ancient Egyptian thinking. The production of the Rosetta Stone. The original is in the British Museum in London. It was discovered by Bouchard, a French officer stationed in the fort during the campaign of Egypt. Champollion later studied it. The stone is in three languages, in hieroglyphics, in Demotic Egyptian and in Ancient Greek. It was the same decree from the pharaohs written in three different languages. Jean-Francois Champollion deciphered the hieroglyphs 20 years after the Rosetta Stone was discovered. To achieve this, this talented Egyptologist relied on his knowledge of several languages. He had no difficulty translating the ancient Greek on the stone, but another script had caught his attention. Demotic Egyptian, a simplified written version of the hieroglyphs for everyday use and that gave Champollion the key he was missing. He noticed the similarity between Demotic Egyptian and another language he could speak fluently, Coptic, the language of Egyptian Christians. The Copts have always been present in Egypt. There are about seven million practicing Copts. One of their spiritual centers is in Wadi El Natrun, a semi-desert region about 100 kilometers south of Rosetta. Like every Sunday, worshippers flock to the monastery of St. Peshoy. They come from all over Egypt to attend the mass held by the monks. The women wear makeup and their Sunday best. The monastery is a place of freedom for this religious minority. Descended from the pharaoh's subjects, 
in this mainly Muslim country. Sameh is a Copt. He is also a tour guide specializing in Egyptology. According to him, the ancient Egyptian civilization is not dead. It lives on in his community. Coptic is the liturgical language of the Egyptian church, and it is the most recent evolution of the language spoken by ancient Egyptians several thousand years ago. For practical reasons, they use the Greek alphabet to write down this language. But since the Greek alphabet doesn't cover all of the sounds of ancient Egyptian, they added seven demotic characters to form the Coptic alphabet. So, during Mass, ancient Egyptian doesn't just live on through the language, it also lives on in the songs and the rhythm and the use of incense. It gives us an idea of what the temples of the ancient Egyptians were like. In the land of the Moezins, the bells ring out a different tune. The history of Christianity is linked to the history of Egypt. Monks have been putting down roots in the desert of Cetis for over 16 centuries. At their peak, there were over 60 monasteries in the region of Wadi al Natrum. Today, only four are still active, the largest being the monastery of Saint Pishoy, founded in the fourth century AD by the saint of the same name. The architecture of the monasteries blends in with the landscape. Everything here reflects the ruggedness of the desert. Domes to keep the air cool and thick walls to keep out the heat. The climate wasn't the only enemy the monks had to contend with. Judging from the monastery's high walls and these incredible fortified dungeons that predated fortified castles. We are coming to the dungeon. To reach it, you must cross a drawbridge. There are dungeons like this in all the monasteries dating from this era, designed to protect the monks from being attacked by the Berbers, who live in the desert around this monastery. The fortress is several stories high. On the ground floor, there is a well with a source of water and the storeroom. On the second floor, there is a church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Then there are cells, and here on the terrace, there is another church dedicated to the Archangel Michael, who protected the monks from enemy attack. A divine protection, which did not prevent some monks from being martyred. But despite the attacks, raids, and even the repression they were subjected to, the Coptic monks of Wadi al Natrum never lost their faith. That unshakable devotion is still written on the walls of the chapel in the monastery of El Surian, close to the monastery of Saint Peshoy. We are in the 5th century 
We are in the 5th century church, which sadly caught fire in 1990. The carpet went up in flames and everything burned. There was a fresco there, which was completely blackened, so a team from the French Institute for Oriental Archaeology came to clean it. While they were cleaning the fresco, they discovered that there was a second fresco underneath it. They managed to lift off the 11th century fresco, keeping it intact, and found themselves in front of this fresco dating from the 7th century, which depicts Jerusalem with the Virgin Mary sitting on a throne. The angel Gabriel next to her and four other characters, Moses and Isaiah on one side and Ezekiel and Daniel on the other. Each of the prophets is holding the prophecy about the arrival of the Messiah. Here there are other frescoes with two layers, one dating from the 7th century and the other from the 11th century. On the semi-dome above me is the 11th century layer, showing a scene from the Annunciation and a scene from the Nativity. And here are some holy horsemen, whose names we do not know, and some holy doctors. This is a 7th century layer. Here you can see the various layers in the church. There are the first, second, third and fourth layers. These frescoes, which have not been ravaged by time, offer visitors a rare opportunity to admire 1,300-year-old murals in their original colours. Through here is Saint Pichoy's cave. That's where he lived in the fourth century. It was common for monks to live in small, enclosed spaces, barely large enough to move around in. And above this cave lies the church, which was built in the fifth century. As you can see, that's not big either. It's about 2.5 meters by 2 meters, no more than that. And it's where Saint Pichoy came to pray. In keeping with tradition, he tied his hair to a rope to prevent him falling asleep so that he could pray for as long as possible. So this is where Saint Pichoy lived and received the monks that he taught. Before it became prevalent throughout Christianity, the notion of a monastic way of life came from this part of the world. The most fervent early Christians wanted to withdraw from worldly temptations. In Egypt, they chose to settle in the deserts where they could pray undisturbed. Some lived in caves. Others used the ancient tombs of the pharaohs. In Luxor, in the Theban hills. In the temple of Hathor, monks built a small chapel and basic cells. On the wall of the temple, they engraved crosses as a sign of their faith. But on the borders of the cataracts of the Nile, on the island of Philae, the presence of cops is sadly far more visible. In this bastion of the religion of the pharaohs, Christians attacked what they considered to be pagan idols. Every Egyptian god has been methodically pounded to symbolize the victory of monotheism over the ancient religions.
Today, the monks are no longer isolated in caves like the early hermits. Instead, they live in communities with very strict rules. When you become a monk, you break all your ties with the outside world. Your friends, your family, and your former profession. We try to form an exclusive and special relationship with God. This is the key to monarchism. Parting from everyone and forming an association with a single being. For that, there are three conditions. You must live in poverty, chastity, and obedience. Those are the three essential elements to becoming a monk. The monastic life is not only contemplative, work is just as important as prayer. The monastery of St. Peshoy houses 120 monks and over 400 lay workers. The monastery is an enterprise with just one goal, self-sufficiency. Almost everything is grown or made on the spot. The meals, the bread, the candles, and especially the wine. Because in a predominantly Muslim country where alcohol is forbidden, it is very difficult to buy wine. We stick a label on the bottles with the name of the monastery and a picture of Saint Peshoy. This one says Wadi El Natrum Valley. Then we just need to add the cap. This wine is Abaka Ulta wine. It is not for sale. We use it here at the monastery and we also give some to churches that don't have the means to procure any. In the days of the pharaohs, wine was kept in amphora. Even then, it was labelled to indicate the vintage, its provenance, and the names of the wine grower and cellar master. Grapes have been grown on the banks of the Nile for 5,000 years. In ancient times, wine was the preserve of an elite, but little by little, it became more democratic. It remains an important element of the ancient Egyptian religion. It was associated with Osiris, the god of victory over death, because wine is a symbol of renewal and its red color evokes blood and eternal life. The Christians also used it to symbolize the blood of Jesus Christ. The great strength of the monks here today, and in the past, is that they have managed to tame a hostile environment and grow crops on the edge of the desert. I used to be an accountant. I learned how to work in the fields and manage workers at the monastery. This is okra. You can eat our vegetables safe in the knowledge that we don't use any chemical fertilizers or pesticides. It's what you might call organic. I have been in the monastery for 30 odd years. I came here in 1990 and I didn't know anything. I've learned all I know here, and it suits me. I love this life.
Living here at the monastery of the good Lord keeps me young. Ancient Egypt is still relevant today. It lives on in the Coptic language, the architecture and certain religious monuments. The Giza pyramids are simply the standout legacy of that time. Modern Egypt also sees itself as the daughter of the pharaohs. In Cairo, the Unknown Soldier Memorial is another direct descendant of those times. Under this pyramid lies one of the most important leaders of modern Egypt, President Anwar al-Sadat, who was assassinated in 1981. It is a tomb fit for a man nicknamed the Pharaoh by his opponents. This ancient past is re-emerging all over Egypt and nowhere more so than in Alexandria. The city was founded by Alexander the Great on the Mediterranean coast in the third century BC. In 2002, the people of Alexandria decided to raise from the ashes a monument which made this city famous over 2,000 years ago. Here we are, in front of the Library of Alexandria. This library building contains several million books and is shaped like the sun rising above the earth. The sun shape evokes Tura, king and father of the gods, who lit up the world with his rays and continues to light up the world with his knowledge. This is a colossal project, every bit as big as the temples of ancient times. An ancient Egyptian would feel right at home with the sun, the moon and the pyramid shape. All the symbols from the past are here today. The new library in Alexandria can only house 8 million books. That's far fewer than the biggest library in the world in the American Congress, which houses 32 million books. But its predecessor was one of the biggest and most famous libraries in the ancient world. It was a collection of the most important scriptures of the time. The library was finished around the same time as the Lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built during the third century BC, during the reign of Ptolemy III. It wasn't just a library for preserving manuscripts, it was also a place for study and research. Archimedes, Euclid, and the man who calculated the Earth's circumference all studied here. Before the invention of printing in the 15th century AD, Papyrus was rare and expensive. To fill the shelves of the old library in Alexandria, the powers that be had an infallible method. They took contributions from passing travelers. Any boat docking in Alexandria was searched and any manuscript found was confiscated from the passenger and copied in the library adjoining the Serapeum or temple so that the original could continue to enrich the library in Alexandria. Then the passenger took a copy. The old library in Alexandria has gone. Between 48 BC and 642 AD, it was the victim of various fires, looting, earthquakes, and even a tidal wave. For 13 centuries, it was little more than a myth but it has been revived today in modern-day Egypt. Ancient Egypt, if we look hard enough, is all around us in our daily lives. This level of the library, which mirrors the sun, and these well-appointed columns, which are reminiscent of Karnak Temple.
ancient Egypt has not disappeared. It lives on in the spirits and minds of today's Egyptians. The gods of the pharaohs still seem to be watching over the inhabitants of the Nile. Three centuries after the first discoveries, Egypt continues to fascinate us. Every month that goes by reveals new treasures buried under the desert sand. The fragmented nose was found in the area during an archaeological dig, so it was stuck back on. It hadn't gone far. Temples, pyramids, necropolises, and ancient cities are just some of the wonders that bear witness to the splendor of past pharaohs and their heirs. The Greeks used to make cakes called pyramids. And when they came to Egypt, they found colossal stone structures in the shape of their cakes, so they gave them the same name. This ancient civilization, which was thought to have been lost, is constantly reinventing itself in the Egypt of the 21st century. We are going to travel through time and space to rediscover it. When he was crossing the land of the pharaohs in around 450 BC, Herodotus proclaimed that Egypt was a gift from the Nile. Called visitors, past and present, he was struck by the contrast between the luxuriance of the banks of the Great River and the aridity of the desert surrounding them. These inhospitable expanses cover 96% of the country, and only 1% of the population lives there. Since the dawn of time, Egyptians have feared the desert. It is the world of the dead, the kingdom of the god Seth, who tried to kill his brother Osiris, who symbolized fertile, nourishing soil. This religious myth reflects the ancestral wariness of the Egyptians for these hostile lands. And yet no pharaoh, sultan, or modern-day leader has been able to rest until they have attempted to tame the Sahara, which means desert in Arabic. It is essential to the Egyptian economy. Since antiquity, slaves, precious woods, and wild animals have passed through it, along trails linking the oases. It is also a gateway for foreign invaders and the land of the nomads that sedentary Egyptians are so wary of. Despite the military presence, Egyptians from the Nile have never really succeeded in controlling this arid land. Today, it is still a place fraught with danger and rebellion. In Cairo, the overpopulated capital of modern-day Egypt, the desert and its dangers seem very far removed from people's day-to-day -day concerns. And yet, it is just there, on the outskirts of the city. As you go upriver towards the south, the River Nile takes on the appearance of a green snake surrounded by hostile lands. One hour from Cairo, the Fayoum Oasis is the first refuge for the living from the dead. The desert surrounding it is particularly arid. Sometimes it doesn't rain for five years. And when the heavens finally open, all hell breaks loose. The water hurtles in torrents along these wadi with untold violence, leaving a lunar landscape in its wake. Wadi al-Hitan hasn't always been the desolate land we see today. A long time ago, it was a sanctuary for some massive animals. We find wonderful bone preserved. And if you go over there, you will see also bone still in the rock. And you see the tissue. Maybe it's a vertebra uh, of a whale. Look at here. One here, one there, over there. Basically everywhere. 
This is why it's called Valley of the Whale. Forty million years ago, we are standing on the bottom of the ocean. So the water was covered most of Egypt at that time. And these, all of these beautiful creatures were swimming all over the place here. We are here looking at the most beautiful fossils in Wadi Hitan. This is the largest whale, largest marine mammal, 80 meters long, that lived uh, 40 million years ago in this place. You can here look at the skull over there, and the tail is just over there. So we are in the stomach area. You see the arms over there, the both arms, the fins, and the legs would be really over there, really tiny legs, uh, comparing to this, this huge animal. Professor Salam has crossed a vast area of the Egyptian deserts in search of fossils. A few years ago, he struck lucky. He was the first Egyptian to have found a new species of dinosaur. He has been something of a celebrity in his country ever since. In 2018, we found a dinosaur skeleton in the late Cretaceous area, which is uh, really a 73 million years old skeleton. It's a plant-eater dinosaur. We named it Mansurasaurus after my university and also named it the species Shahini after my wife's name. It took millions of years for the sea to recede from Wadi al hetan giving way to terra firma, a series of different climates followed in Egypt. First the jungle, then forests colonized this part of the world. But in 5000 BC, the temperatures suddenly soared and desertification occurred, forcing the majority of the population to settle along the banks of the River Nile. It is perhaps this change in climate which is at the origin of Egyptian civilization. In this confined space, there was a need to organize a society, creating a strong royal power around a pharaoh. The desert took a while to colonize Egypt. The Giza Plateau didn't become arid until 1000 BC. The foot of the pyramids was in the savannah. Egyptians used to rub shoulders with the sort of animals now found in East Africa. They are depicted in bas reliefs, offering their dead various species of gazelle and hyena, which they are thought to have tamed and even eaten. Desert animals such as horned vipers or jackals are also present. Of all the Egyptian deserts, the Libyan desert is the most feared. It covers an area of over three million square kilometers. The chances of survival are slim for travelers who get lost in its vastness. Their only hope is to find an oasis such as the one at Dakhla. Dakhla is a veritable peace haven, luxuriance in the face of chaos. The oasis owes its lushness to the work of humans who, over the millennia, have irrigated it and landscaped it. These palm groves stretching as far as the eye can see are the fruits of their labors. The desert climate is perfect for dates. El Noir Farm has planted 50,000 date palms. This plant is the emblem of the oases. It has so many uses, even for weaving hats as protection from the sun. Thank you. 
Oasis dwellers are dependent on date palms. They cultivate other crops too, such as wheat and rice, which are mainly for their own consumption. But their main source of income comes from date palms. Our dates are exported all over the world, to the Arab world, of course, to Morocco and the United Arab Emirates, but also to Russia. They are even starting to be exported to Europe. Thanks to the quality of our dates, Dakla Oasis is on the regional map and even the international one. I haven't left the oasis for two years. Before that, I was traveling for five years. I was an engineer in the oil industry. I used to travel to Cairo a lot, but I prefer life in the oasis, with its calm and serenity, far from the crowds and the noise. The technique used for picking dates has barely changed since the days of the pharaohs. Dates are still popular products. In ancient Egyptian depictions of their visions of paradise, date palms had pride of place next to the fields of flax and wheat, laden with goodness. Oases like the one at Dakla might well have inspired Allah's sensual paradise, a shady garden in which you only need to reach out a hand to pick the juicy fruits. This oasis may not be that nirvana, but the 8,000 inhabitants of Dakla have still chosen to stay here, far from a world that is in perpetual motion. Here they are spread over 17 villages, of which Kassa is the oldest and most beautiful. Built on the ruins of a Roman fortress, this medieval village has retained some of the character of those fortifications. Today, it is virtually uninhabited. Sabi, the keeper of the site, is one of the very few visitors to this abandoned maze. This medieval town is the symbol of the Dakla oasis. Lots of tourists love this ancient city. It is atypical, and its houses and streets radiate a unique atmosphere. You see this? That's palm wood. That's the wood that was most often used here. There are very few houses with inscriptions like this. Wealthy people put up these signs with poems or verses from the Quran. You no longer see this type of inscription on the facade. Wood is hardly ever used either. Everything is modern. Kassa was settled in the 8th century AD, but it didn't reach its peak until the 16th century during the Ottoman Empire, as proved by the madrasa which served as a school in the mornings and a court of justice in the afternoons. Muslim judges, or Qadis, used to try cases in an alcove with the witnesses appearing before them. The defendants waited in two separate prisons, the women's prison and the men's prison. What strikes casual visitors to this ancient city is that everything has been preserved in its original state, as if the inhabitants have only just left. Here we are in a communal mill. This is how it worked. 
There was a cow turning the millstone to grind the wheat. The other job consisted of passing grains of wheat through this hole using this pendulum. This piece of wood can be adjusted to suit the height of the millstone, which determines the fineness of grain of the flour. This mill has been abandoned for a hundred odd years. Nowadays, modern machinery is used to grind wheat or rice. Everything is electric. There were several reasons why the inhabitants abandoned this medieval city. Adobe is a very fragile building material. When it rains, which is rare, the walls need to be rebuilt. Modcons also played an important role. Running water, electricity and mains drainage managed to convince the more reticent among them. Today, only three or four families still live in this historic city centre. A few artisans have chosen to stay here to work. This potter's studio is less noisy than a blacksmith's, but still, for thousands of years, pottery has been essential for life in the desert. We make carafes, jugs, and jars, anything you can make out of clay to keep water in. There didn't used to be fridges or metal containers to keep water in. But people are rediscovering the benefits of pottery. Doctors recommend that you drink water from pots for their mineral properties. The ancient Egyptians used pottery as ice boxes, as backpacks, and as flasks. It served every purpose. People kept all sorts of foodstuffs in it, such as meat or dried fish. Without it, there would have been no trade. The jars were a means of exporting oil or wine. Wooden barrels weren't invented until much later by the Gauls. We are sadly the last generation of potters. After us, there will be no one. It's a difficult skill to master. You have to learn it when you're young. You can't do it when you're older. It's over. No one wants to learn anymore. As with most oases, mass tourism and packed tourist coaches never make it as far as Dakla. That's what Maged likes about it. This Egyptian guide has made a bold choice to show discerning travelers another side to Egypt off the beaten track. When you travel from one oasis to another, you see only desert. Then suddenly, you come to another oasis with its lush vegetation at that moment. The oasis takes on the full meaning of the term. I never cease to be amazed by the peace and serenity, by this return to nature, the purity. I come here to cleanse myself of all the stresses of the city, all the day-to-day -day worries. I come to this region to recharge my batteries.
You might imagine the inhabitants of oases to be completely self-sufficient, but there are many outside influences here, the most important coming from the inhabitants of the Nile Valley. In Dakhla, archaeologists have discovered traces from the days of the pharaohs dating back to 246 BC. The majestic tombs of ancient rulers show just how important this region was for central government. We are in front of the Mastaba of Remtika, who was the governor of the oasis during the 6th dynasty under the reign of Pepi II. Just next to it, you can see another mastaba. The word mastaba now refers to the upper part, which is this rectangular shape. The mastaba of Remtika is missing that part. Its collapse is what led to the cave being protected. Mastabas, which are these rectangular edifices, surmounted the tombs of pharaohs from the first and second dynasties in around 3000 BC until a genius architect came and revolutionized these royal burial grounds. Imhotep, who worked for the pharaoh Djoser, came up with the idea of stacking the mastabars on top of one another, thus creating a pyramid shape. This pyramid, with its different levels, was the first of its kind in Egypt. There are over a hundred pyramids in the country. Latterly, the pharaohs chose to be buried in the Valley of Kings. What all these periods have in common is that the burial grounds are always in the middle of the desert. The idea was to preserve the agricultural land on the banks of the Nile, which was already limited, and also to protect the mummies from the damp, which is their worst enemy. So the desert naturally became the kingdom of the dead. We are now about seven meters below ground level. On this wall, we can see a very traditional scene. The sort found on all the tombs from the Old Kingdom. In the main passageway, there was always a portrait of the owner of the tomb. So that's Remtika with his wife opposite him. The scene is quite damaged but we can see that she is bringing a lotus flower to her nostrils to inhale its scent. From the Old Kingdom onwards, the walls of these private tombs would have shown a variety of scenes depicting daily life and sometimes the funeral, whereas the walls of royal tombs featured exclusively texts and funeral scenes. So if all that had remained in Egypt were the royal tombs, we would have missed out on all the information gleaned from these fabulous scenes of daily life. For example, these scenes of plowing. We can see a plow here with some cattle. There are hunting scenes here too, like everywhere else. Here in the middle of the desert, it's even easier to go hunting. It was one of their favorite sports. The governors, who were representatives of the king, built such elaborate tombs because the oases were vital to the pharaohs. This region is situated on a very important trade route called Darb el Arbaï, meaning 40-day route. It was the caravan trail that connected what is now the region of Asyut with Darfur in Sudan. All the goods from Africa, which were coveted at that time, ebony, ivory, gold, and exotic animals, were transported along that route, and it was such an important trade route that the omnipresence and power of the state was very much in evidence. There were control posts and toll booths all along the trade route, which just shows how important it was to the kings and pharaohs who lived miles away from this region. Because the seat of power was in Memphis, which was situated in what is now Greater Cairo, but they felt the need to demonstrate their power all along the Darb el Arbaïn trade route. So, the administration was established in Dakla very early on, but the same is not true of another oasis. Situated over 500 kilometers from Cairo, Egypt didn't gain control of Siwa until the 6th century BC. 70 kilometers from the Libyan border, 
Siwa has long been protected by the dunes of the Great Sand Sea that surrounds it. And yet, in the middle of this inhospitable world, small lakes are gradually appearing. They are a reminder of the sea that once covered the desert millions of years ago. Egyptian tourists love the scary experience of coming here from Cairo. Even with its hot water springs, they see the desert as a place fraught with danger. In the distance, we can just make out Lake Siwa. The water is so abundant here that, due to a lack of drainage, it forms saltwater lakes. The town centre is a calm place. The seaweeds are by nature placid. This is a far cry from the frenzy of the big cities. This serenity is embodied in the 7th century Charlie Fortress, which overlooks the town. Built from blocks of clay mixed with salt, it has gradually crumbled over the centuries. Doha is a tour guide who encourages tourists to take their time and appreciate this special atmosphere. When tourists first came here, they are fascinated by the fact that there is barely any transition between the interminable desert and this lush green oasis. There is a very clear dividing line between the two. There are 281 springs here, and the inhabitants of Siwa live among them. Some of these springs, spouting up all over the oasis, serve as natural swimming pools for passing bathers. There is one whose popularity has never waned, because here you feel as if you are swimming in the wake of Egypt's greatest queen. We are here beside a spring known as the Sun Spring, or Cleopatra's Spring. Some people say that Cleopatra came here to bathe. She took great care of herself. She used to bathe in ass's milk, perfumed with lotus flowers. This spring is one of the best-loved springs by Egyptians because they feel as if they're following in Cleopatra's footsteps and making themselves beautiful. People love to swim around the spring. These springs are very relaxing places, with the water and the palm trees that surround them. Cleopatra, the penultimate queen of the Hellenistic dynasty of Ptolemy, may never have bathed at Siwa, but the Greek influence is apparent, particularly in the oasis' main necropolis. The Hill of the Dead overlooks the town. Archaeologists have listed 1,500 tombs there. Many of them are damaged. The mountainside still bears the scars of all the unofficial digs carried out by seaweeds over the centuries. Tomb robbers removed the bas reliefs and sold them to foreigners. By some miracle, Siamun's tomb remains intact. The first thing you see when you go in is a typically Egyptian symbol, Newt, the goddess of the sky who eats the sun every night and gives birth to it again every morning in the form of a falcon. The decorations on the walls evoke the Hellenistic era, curly hair, beards and moustaches, Greek togas. The tomb dates from the Libyan period, a time when there were lots of Greek. Further on, a goddess under a sycamore tree is carrying a vase, from which, in between two trickles of water, a chain of anks is flowing, a sign of life in ancient Egypt, reminding us that in the past, just like today, the inhabitants of these oases were aware of their good fortune. But Siwa's 3,200 inhabitants have had to learn to live a life cut off from everything. It wasn't until 1984 that a tarmac road was built, linking them to the rest of the world. 
and it wasn't until 1987 that they discovered the joys of electricity. Perhaps it is that isolation which has preserved this unique culture. Siwa is home to the only Berber community in Egypt, the most eastern community in North Africa. Berbers are present throughout the Maghreb, as far west as Mauritania and as far south as Niger. Yusuf is an ardent defender of this culture and upholds all aspects of it. This lunchtime, he is entertaining the children of his family during their school holidays. To please his nephews, nieces, and his own children, he has chosen a dish that is typical of Siwa. Now that I have covered them with sand, my work is done. We will dig them out in about an hour's time. The most important thing about this recipe is that it stays well sealed. If there is a leak, the chickens will be too dry. When Yusuf speaks to his brothers, sons and nephews, even though they can all speak Arabic, he prefers to use a local Berber dialect called Siwi. Most people here speak Siwi at home. Some people teach their children to say dad in Arabic. But I teach them the Siwi word, ab. They need to learn Siwi so they don't forget their roots. They will learn Arabic at school anyway. The advantage of the Siwa Oasis is that it is far from everything. When tourists come here and spend a bit of time with us, we influence them rather than them influencing us. One thing is certain, if we lived near a city, we would struggle to preserve our traditions and customs. The gentleness of the inhabitants of Siwa is in stark contrast to the harshness of their environment. The lake, a symbol of the oasis, is not the haven of peace it first appears to be. In this salty water, no fish or amphibian can survive. The salt covers the banks and the surface of the water like a shroud. But the seaweeds have turned it to their advantage. Egyptians have been eating salt since Neolithic times, supplied by the inhabitants of the oasis. Salt mining is still Siwa's main industry. You start by digging a pond, and then you hit the layer of salt. At this stage, the salt you extract is still brown because it contains soil. To wash it, you have to rinse it in water. We use the mechanical digger to give it about 15 rinses. When the salt is nice and white, we pile it up and leave it to dry. Salt from Siwa is appreciated for its flavor, but large quantities of it are exported to Europe or Canada where it is simply used to de-ice the roads in winter. This big machine is a grinder. This is where the salt crystals are ground. This is a 12 caliber grinder. There are lots of different calibers, from the highest to the lowest, which is used to make table salt. For us, salt is a gift from God. Ever since it was discovered here in Siwa, everyone has profited from it. Moreover, whatever we mine is replaced every year thanks to sedimentation in the lakes nearby. It really is a godsend for the oasis and for the local economy. Exporting salt has been going on for a long time. In the first century AD, this product started circulating around the Mediterranean basin. The Siwa Oasis, like all the oases, makes most of its income from trade. Ever since antiquity, 
Siwa has been forging links between North Africa and Egypt, exporting salt, dates, olives, oil and wine. Four kilos for a tenner. Four kilos for a tenner. Four kilos for just a tenner. You heard, four kilos for a tenner. This is as good as it gets, boss. You won't find cheaper. You won't find cheaper elsewhere. Egypt's caravan trails have been trade routes for 4,500 years. Nowadays, goods are transported along tarmac roads. All you need is a lorry. But for a long time, the caravans consisted of donkeys until they were replaced by another animal, which only came to be tamed later in 1000 BC. Dromedaries have adapted to the desert. This animal brought wealth to the oases. It can carry a load of 250 kilograms and swallow 135 liters of water in just a few seconds, allowing it to last several days in the hot sun. The Bedouins have made it their mascot. These nomads rarely come near the oases unless it is to tend to the well-being of their favorite animals. We have rented this plot of land in the oasis to use as pasture. The dromedaries need to eat fresh grass. We accompany the animals. This is more than a job. It is our life. We take care of our animals because our lives depend on these dromedaries. In the past, everything was linked to the dromedaries. Meat, milk. They even protected humans from storms and hardship. People used to ride on their backs. They transported people's worldly goods, even crops. Dromedaries can carry anything. I'm getting them ready to spend the night here. I have to tie them up. Otherwise, they might wander off and get lost. To be honest with you, I don't really have anywhere to put them. I'm not really settled in the region. That's just how it is. I don't settle anywhere. Every day, I stay somewhere new. <laughs> In theory, all Bedouins know how to take care of dromedaries, but the younger generation is losing this expertise. Take young Mahmoud here. His grandfather kept dromedaries, but he didn't have time to teach him. He's been accompanying me for a month now. He is learning techniques for approaching them and communicating with them, but he's still a bit scared of them. He'll soon get used to them. Nomads from the eastern and the western desert filled ancient Egyptians with fear and mistrust. They had a reputation for being versatile, quick to help invaders and to take up arms no matter what the occasion. Invaders often arrived via the desert, with the Nubians coming from the south and the Libyans from the west. In the Medinet Harbu temple in Luxor, bas reliefs praising Ramesses III tell the story of his victories over the desert people. The Libyans can be recognized by their beards and the Nubians by their black African traits. Further on, a scribe is carrying out a macabre task. He is counting a pile of sawn off hands to draw up an inventory of the number of enemies killed. Throughout their long history, the Egyptians haven't always succeeded in holding off invaders. The Persians, Greeks, and Romans 
all settled for long periods in the land of the pharaohs. They all tried to control these arid stretches, a source of instability for the country, but very few conquerors dared to go there in person. It was the desert, stretching back thousands of kilometers behind this lake, that nearly killed Alexander the Great. When he finally arrived here, he consulted the oracle of the god of Siwa. This was in around 331 BC. Alexander the Great had just toppled the Persian Empire, which Egypt was a part of. To legitimize his rule, he appeared before the oracle of Ammon in Siwa, which, along with the oracle in Delphi, was the most prestigious oracle of the ancient world. In this temple, the Greek conqueror hoped to direct his questions to Ammon, the most important god in ancient Egypt. Like anyone else who came here, including the priests who worked in these temples, Alexander the Great had to go down into this well to perform his ablutions before he could go and consult Ammon. This is the sanctuary. In the middle stood the statue of the god Ammon. Alexander the Great went to ask his questions. He had two questions in mind. The first was to ask the name of those who had killed his father. And the second was to ask whether he could avenge his father. Ammon told him repeatedly that his father wasn't dead. His father was with the gods. Alexander really liked that response. And the second response he got was that he was the son of a god. That was the ideal response. Thinking he was like the pharaohs, he thought he had the right to govern the whole country. These questions weren't just personal, they were also political. He needed validation and the agreement and acceptance of an Egyptian god. Alexander must have heard an actual voice answering his questions, but it wasn't the voice of a god. The priests at the oracles used various devices to trick their visitors. Some even hid inside hollow statues and made them speak. In Siwa, the system was more rudimentary, but just as effective. When Alexander the Great came here, the statue was over there. The priest accompanied him to the statue and then climbed up there by a back route that was hidden, of course. The priest was able to speak without Alexander the Great seeing him, though he thought it was the voice of the god speaking to him. In reality, more than the god Ammon, it was the clergy that interested Alexander. By finding favor with the priests, he was assured of their precious support to reign over these mystical Egyptians. In the Karga oasis in southern Egypt, other invaders have left their mark. The Romans were the last conquerors of the kingdom of the pharaohs. Following the example of their predecessors, they did their utmost to protect this distant frontier of their vast empire. The imposing Roman fortress overlooking the oasis protected the nearby caravan trail. Like Alexander the Great, the Romans were willing to reconcile with Egyptian beliefs. In the middle of the fortress, they erected a temple in the best ancient Egyptian tradition. It is dedicated to Ammon for the Egyptians and to Jupiter for the Romans. A new religion soon upset this established order. From the third century AD, the Karga oasis became a refuge for early Christians fleeing violent persecution by the Romans. The necropolis of El Bagawat, with its 200 tomb chapels, bears witness to a surprising continuity. Like the ancient Egyptians, the Christians came to bury their dead in the desert. The oldest tombs on this site date back to the late 3rd, early 4th centuries AD. Later in the 5th century, the Nestorians came in. 
Nestorius was the bishop of Constantinople, and he was declared a heretic at Ephesus in 431. So this site was occupied first by Christians fleeing persecution by Roman pagans, and later by Christians fleeing persecution by other Christians who had different ideas about the nature of Christ. Nestorius declared that Mary was the mother of mankind and not the mother of God. This site is remarkable. It's unique. As you can see, these tomb chapels were more or less elaborate, depending on the wealth of the families. Some even have courtyards, with columns at the entrance to the tomb, whereas others are really quite modest. Some of these tomb chapels have been painstakingly decorated. Visitors can still admire these 1,600-year-old paintings, reflecting the faith of these early Christians. Here we see Moses guiding the people of Israel to their fate of having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years in the Sinai Desert, pursued by an army of pharaohs. This is the scene that has made this chapel famous. There is perhaps a link to be made between this flight into the Sinai Desert and the flight here towards another desert with its oases. Here we have a very interesting detail. There are two normal Christian crosses here, but underneath them we have this shape derived from the ancient Egyptian Ankh, the symbol of life, adopted by early Christians in Egypt. When they were unable to declare their Christian faith, they substitute their crosses for this Ankh, or Anset cross, inherited from ancient Egypt. The exiled Christians finally got used to their life in the desert. There are traces to be found at the Karga Oasis, which suggests they stayed here until the 7th century AD. For modern Egyptians, living in the desert is not an obvious choice. 94% of the population still lives on the banks of the Nile. But demographic problems have caught up with them. In 1900, Egypt had 10 million inhabitants. It has 100 million inhabitants today, and it is predicted that that figure will rise to 200 million by the end of the century. Leaders have no choice but to free up more agricultural land as they try to feed everyone and relieve the congestion in the old city of Cairo with its 20 million inhabitants. 45 kilometers from Cairo, a new capital is emerging, like a mirage in the middle of the desert. There is a massive project underway to build a city seven times the size of inner Paris. We are building a new capital for Egypt. Behind me, you can see the site of the new parliament. Over there, in front of me, is where the ministries will be. They are currently scattered all over Cairo. This way, all the ministries will be grouped together in the same place. Every day, around 200,000 to 300,000 people come to work here, both engineers and builders. It is a good way to solve the problem of unemployment. Obviously, it's easier to live on the banks of the Nile than in the middle of the desert. But with 100 million inhabitants concentrated around the delta and the riverbanks, it was time to act. It was time to decide to conquer the desert.
Work has begun on the first residential neighborhood. It covers a surface area of 420 hectares and 25 blocks of flats are being built. With the help of publicity campaigns, the authorities are hoping to attract some of the inhabitants of Cairo. In 20 years' time, the new capital should be able to accommodate about 6 million people. Convincing 6 million people to leave the historic city of Cairo to live in the middle of the desert won't be easy, but we are relying on our ability to transform this patch of desert into a paradise, and that's what will make them want to come here. Like the pharaohs before them, successive presidents of modern Egypt have all tried to build their city in the desert. Most of these new metropolises haven't been the success they hoped for. Whether they like it or not, Egyptians are one day going to have to make the desert habitable. They should seek inspiration from the Bedouins and Berbers who have lived there in harmony with nature for thousands of years.